Okay, we're just about there. We're now streaming live on Facebook, it says. There we go. <laughs> yeah, there goes mine. Now streaming live on Facebook, it says. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hello, David. Hello. Going to go ahead. We're going to get started into our committee. Actually, we only have one first reading, no second, third, or pending. And it's ordinance number 21 01 Ms. Norris. Muted, Andrea. You're, on, you're muted, Andrea. Thank you. We'll bring our committee to order at 601. <laughs> of counting, it looks like all members are present. Uh, the item is 21001, an ordinance to increase the salary of Mayor of New Franklin to $90,000 per year. The sponsor, Jim Cotts and Andrew Fetterman. Yeah, so um, I'll jump in before Jim does. And uh, I just want to start off by saying first that this was completely unsolicited. Uh, it's just an overdue item that we need to take care of, in my opinion. Uh, the mayor's salary has not gone up uh, since we became a city. And uh, every, everyone else, every other employee um, within the city ha pay has increased every year, so, uh, or thereabouts anyhow. But um, I think that's something that's very overdue and, and that is needed. And again, it wouldn't go in effect until the next term. Uh, so January 1 of 2022. Jim? There. So again, uh, you can't see me, but I'm here. My, the camera's not working on my my computer. Um, we uh, we we've, we've been talking about this for a little while, and we only have the opportunity to do this every four years, uh, and it has to be done at this time of year. It has to be approved by council 45 days before uh, the petitions uh, for the the position are due in, which be about the middle beginning of June. Uh, so, so we need to pass this uh, by our, I believe by our second meeting of April. So we have plenty of time to take time on this to, uh, if anybody wants to take time and uh, solicit any input from, from the community. Uh, I, the, this, the salary of 90,000 a year um, is, is kind of um, uh, possibly like a starting point uh, put something in there for us to think about, but I think it's a good starting point. Um, it's still lower than the mayors of Barberton and Green, uh, just as, as a reference and obviously lower than the city of Akron. Uh, but looking at it uh, from the beginning at 72,000, if the uh, position were to receive a 1% a increase every year from, from the beginning, it would be right now would be right around 90,000. And if it was a one and a half percent increase each year, it'd be well over 90,000. Uh, so that's, that's where the 90,000 came in. Uh, I think it's a good number. I think it's a good starting point for us to discuss. Uh, as Andy mentioned, there has not been an increase in this position since the beginning of time for the city of New Franklin. And as he stated, it's, it's uh, overdue. Uh, and then you, you can look at the job that Mayor Adamson has done for us and for the city. Uh, in that position, the, the amount of time and, and hours and, and stress that goes into the position, uh, it, he certainly has done his part uh, of this. And, uh, and I feel very, very comfortable with him being our mayor, very comfortable with, with the job he has done and, and every, all the work that he has gone in, especially this past year with the COVID and, and putting forth all the effort to, to make sure we're getting what we can get and, and doing the research. Um, you know, we, we look at other things that, that he's been involved with, with the Tudor House. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we have issues going on with it now with the uh, with possible management and stuff. But over the last few years and, and putting that the Tudor House in position to to be at least breaking even, if not making money. And then then trying to working with the, the commission to to try to come up with activities and events to go on at, at the Tudor House. Uh, along with the weddings, uh, the bridges that we've had issues with, uh, 
whether, whether it's, it's in our city or not, whether it's, it's an emergency situation that had to be taken care of because the, the rain washed it out uh, and, and getting things done and, and making the phone calls and, and knowing who to talk to and getting it done. So um, again, I'm um, trying not to be a cheerleader, but I think this is, as Mr. Federman said, is overdue. Uh, we need to look at it and, and we need to act on it. So uh, uh, there you go. All right. I, I guess the only concern I have, and I agree, if we were given Paul this raise, I would agree. But of course, we all know we have to get it done before the election of our mayor. And it very well could be Paul, but it could be somebody else that has no experience. And we all know how elections go. They could have no experience whatsoever. And we throw them in there and we're going to give them nine, we're going to give them an $18,000 raise from where we're at currently with possibly no experience. Again, if we were giving it to Paul, I'm all for it, but I'm, I'm hesitant. And I know it, it's a double-edged sword because we don't know. It could very well be Paul and it could not be Paul. So, you know, you'd have to feel comfortable with who might be the next mayor being maybe somebody that's never even held office because there's no requirements on running for mayor. You know, it could be somebody that get it, went out there and ran and gets it and has no idea how to run this city. So we would be giving them $90,000. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a tough decision for me, even though Paul deserves it, if, if I knew he was going to be our mayor, but we don't know that. That's just my opinion on it. Well, and I, I certainly uh, appreciate your opinion there. And unfortunately, one of the situations we have is the only time we can, as I understand it, the only time we can uh, present for an increase in the salary is during an election year for the next term. So we will never know who the, uh, the, who the mayor is. And uh, uh, so I, I guess to a degree, we just have to look at the position and the, the experience that we've had with that position and, and trust that the person that comes in will be as uh, hopefully as dedicated as, as the previous mayor, whoever that is at whichever time. So we're always, have that, uh, I guess, fear <laughs> of increasing in salary for somebody that we don't know who's going to be that position, unfortunately. Yeah, and I understand that, but you know, I've heard a lot of talk through the years when we were giving raises to our office people, and it should be on what they do, you know, how they perform. It should be a performance based raises. And I, I know I, this doesn't fit that situation, but it's that's an $18,000 raise to for the unknown. And I, and I get that we have to do it and I understand all that. And, and I would hope that Paul would be our next mayor, but you know, it's going to be one of those things. I just, it's, I know you, that's the only time we can do it, but it's, I mean, I don't know how you get around not doing it, but I, that, that's just the concerns I have. Mr. Mr. Stock, David, I completely agree I, with you. Uh, and David. I, I, I just want to say, I completely agree with you, Mr. Stock. Um, and Unfortunately, our charter is written in such a way that we don't have the opportunity to do performance evaluations for uh, for elected officials. Uh, and eighteen thousand a year, yeah, yes, that's a huge jump. I <laughs> I get that also. But it's been how many years since the position was created? So it's it's one thing if we we did it after the first opportunity we had, you know, fifteen, sixteen years ago, what whatever. Uh, <clears throat> you know, no, it wouldn't be an eighteen thousand dollar increase. Uh, but it's been 20 years. Um, so yeah, it's a huge jump and, and I get that. And, and I was uncomfortable too, but again, this is, this is a, a number for us to talk about And You know, maybe it's not 90,000. Maybe we amend it to where is, is 150,000 or maybe we amend it to where is 80,000 or, or whatever number. Uh, and I, I'm sorry to cut you off, Ms. Jones, please go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> I, I agree with David on this. I think this is something that's very scary and probably Paul's a little embarrassed when he looks at that number because he knows as well as anybody how dire the economics are right now. But I do think it would behoove us to talk with the area citizens and get their input on it. Because I'm gonna tell you honestly, I think they're gonna have a lot to say because we have a lot of people that have lost their jobs. They've taken pay decreases and if I remember, Last meeting, we had discussions about giving Susan Cook, who I think is excellent at her job, payment for overtime she put in. And there were three of us, I believe, that voted against that because we didn't think it was fair to say that when you're a salaried person, that for overtime work, you need to be compensated. And if I remember correctly, you were one of those, Jim. 
and, and and I was, and I still still believe that. But this mm -hmm. is this is uh, apples and oranges, I believe. Uh, this I is don't. We're looking I look at, at it the same I way. Disagree. I think Paul I does disagree. a terrific job. Well, this isn't. I, I mean, this, this isn't being compensated for any overtime. This is just catching up. I mean, even if we would do a percentage, uh, incremental percentages, um, you know, over the next however many years, or, or write that in. Um, I mean, the fact that there's three employees of below that report to them to the mayor that are you know have a higher salary than his and, and that's you know i mean we voted for that um mm -hmm. and I, I think that that I, I don't know i mean obviously we have time for discussion and, and to ask everybody and, and get some input um and i'm not opposed to to, to you know like, like jim said 90 is an arbitrary number uh, you got to start somewhere i i agree i mean i i'm not against it i just got to get my head wrapped around it a little bit more on, you know, where we stand on that. You know, I don't know if there's, and I, I don't even know if it's possible that if there, and I guess we'd have to check with our law director or the charter, if there could be an increase after two years or, I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not sure how that would work. I don't know if that's possible. You know, you got a starting and then after two years, I mean, that could be, if that was out front of the election and somebody that was running would know that that's how it worked. I'm not sure that's even possible, but at least it's a different starting point or just a, a comment, I should say. And it's one of the reasons why we're introducing it now, because we have until the second meeting of April to, um, uh, to do something with this. Uh, so it gives us plenty of time to talk about it. It gives us plenty of time to get input from the citizens as far as how they feel and, and what type of uh, a number they, they feel comfortable with. Um, so I, I will say that uh, I, I post the agenda on uh, Facebook uh, when it comes out for us. And, and usually we're getting comments right away from people about different things that are posted. Uh, there was no comments uh, from, from this posting uh, of the agenda, which really kind of surprised and, and shocked me. We did get one email from a citizen asking, basically asking the same questions that, that you all are. Uh, and, and they're very valid questions. I agree. That's, but again, that's why it's out here now so that everybody has an opportunity to talk about it, ask questions, negotiate, you know, figure out what we want to do if we want to do anything. So. Okay. I think that with all those comments being said, David, we're going to go ahead and, and keep this on time. We're not going to ask for any first reading. This um, merits a little bit more discussion and a little bit of public input. Yeah, I agree, Andrea. So we're going to do that with our committee. Any other comments, other suggestions? I think that's the way to go for now. I agree. All right. With that, our committee will conclude at 614. Thank you. I appreciate the conversation. Thank you, Andrea. All right. Again, there's no uh, other legislation this evening. Anybody have anything they want to bring up during their committee? I do, David, if you don't mind. No, I don't I have, Go ahead. <laughs> I have a couple of questions that I have gotten from just residents asked me, and I don't have an answer. When they run the gas and the water lines on Manchester Road, I got the impression, and it could have just been an impression, that those run together. Now, is there a set space between the two? Normally, when you're putting in lines, there is a set space. As a contractor, you would know that. So I'm sure that's probably true with the uh, Judy. I'm not a contractor. That's been said. Yeah, I am no, not Judy, a contractor. I, I'm, I'm I just can, a carpenter. I can speak to that. But Andy, Andy's in bit. business. Okay. Yeah, now, when they run the, the bit, gas yes, lines and the water lines and the sewer lines, isn't there a set yeah. limit between those, Andy? Yes. Yeah, so, so the water and sewer have to be opposite sides of the road. Uh, gas will have to be in its own right of way, uh, separated. You know, there's a separation in between each utility. Um, every now and then, uh, communications can go in a foot above power if it's underground. Um, but other than that, yeah, every utility is going to have a separation. So actually, septic would go on one side, or would sewer, did you say sewer and water sewer? have to be separate? I'm yeah. sorry, I said yeah. septic. Sewer would go on That's one right. side, and water would go on the other side of the the road. And I, so if I can speak to that one for a second. That sure. is the norm. Um, <clears throat> the standard is 10 feet. Okay. So the, the sewer, and, and I'm speaking, uh, this is what I've been told, but we, we had some uh, pretty uh, 
intense conversations uh, about uh, 10 days ago with Summit County Sanitary Sewer and the guys from Aqua. We had ODNR in there as well, and and uh, and us and the engineers for the city. Anyway, there was a big, there was nine of us, so we were safe. Everybody had masks on. Anyway, gotcha. Uh, the upshoot it from the experts is this: that the that the sewer, the water, and stormwater, they have to be ten feet apart. And to achieve that, as Mr. Fetterman said, normally sewer goes on one side of the street and water goes on the other side of the street. This is what I understand is the practice. But they can be on the same side of the street as long as they're 10 feet apart. Uh, and in, in fact, we're going to have one circumstance like that on, on uh, State Route 93. Uh, when the water comes up uh, Renninger to uh, 93, uh, when it goes north, it'll be on the east side. And uh, there are dry lines for the sewer already on the west side from Vanderhoof up to about Renninger. Uh, and those, they're going to continue when they do get around to the sewer, and they'll stay on the uh, on the west side. Um, the wa water aqua wanted to put theirs on that side also, uh, because there, apparently there were a number of obstacles on the east side, and so they're going to cross over and they're going to be on the west side also. But they're going to be uh, this the requisite ten feet apart, and all of that has to when the sewer and water that all has to be approved by the Ohio EPA. So we have you know so that's a, that, that's under their jurisdiction and their authority. Um, and, uh, but now I totally defer to Mr. Fetterman when it comes to the, the gas lines and those things, uh, I don't know the answer on that one. I, I, um, I, yeah, I don't know how far they have to be away from, um, water or sewer, uh, as far as communication, since we, power could be transferred on there. Uh, we have to have, I believe a minimum of 36 to 48 inches in between. Okay, gentlemen, then let me ask you, are you saying they can be 10 feet apart. One is say five feet down and the other is 15 feet down or side by side, 10 feet apart. Yeah, lateral, side by side. So they would be going into the property at least 15 feet? Well, they in a, at least these plans are both drawn that they would stay within the road right away. So that the road right away extends far enough on the west side that they can both be in the road right away and still be 10 feet apart. And, and not have to uh, 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 appropriate any property from the landowners on that stretch. Okay. And how far is that from the middle, uh, from the middle uh, line? Do you remember? I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer on that one. It, it's no, different yeah, it's on very, every street, but it's, yeah. yeah. So it, and that's on that state route. I'm going to guess it's pretty extensive, but I don't know the answer for sure. How about homeowners? It would be uh, the same like, for homeowners. They're not going to encroach upon lawns and things. They're just going to stay within the road right away. They'll stay in the road right away. Where there's where, where you run into some conflicts is when the homeowner has basically utilized the road right away, like most homeowners most do, including do. me. Yes. <laughs> okay, my lawn runs right to the right up to the street, yes. but uh, I think that road right away out there is something like twenty feet. So there's about ten feet of what I think is my lawn uh, is is the city's road right away. That's what I was asking, Paul. And would the company doing the work repair that the way it was? Or do, is that up to the homeowner? Because basically it's the road right of way. The, uh, the contract we have with Aqua is that they are, that they're required to repair, to restore to the best of their ability to the, to the condition. And I'm glad that came up because we had, uh, uh, we got an inquiry from a gentleman on Catalina uh, there's been some heavy equipment over there, and he's had some, uh, and I guess, Mr. Cotts, this is my uh, kind of lazy way of responding uh, to that. I just saw it this afternoon. But, uh, yeah, they have an obligation to restore uh, to the best of their ability to the condition that existed. When you get to lawns and those kind of things, I suppose that's primarily going to be planning. Uh, you know, of, of a more concern to a lot of people is concrete, uh, you know, if they got a concrete drive. And they're, they, they're going to have to restore these. Uh, well, and, and they're trying to go conversation underneath. with them and and hopefully they're you know we're not going to have to fight about it um i don't expect that we will since we're just getting started with these folks okay but, it, they but again oh, i'm sorry judy to but the it's going to take some time i'm sorry it, please say that again then i want to say one more thing i talked over they were you. restored to the best of their ability yeah as close as, as close as they can to the condition that existed before the construction but it's going to take a while to do that naturally they're going to have to finish the construction before. So 
I think what we're going to see, we're going to see them leave the area. And people say, wait a minute, what about my yard? Uh, and but, you know, it's it's March, you know, and they really can't do much right this minute. So right. I think some of this stuff is going to follow. I will tell you that the city will be a vigorous advocate for any property owner who feels that they, they didn't get proper restoration. Uh, they can uh, people can count on that. And I think with the heavy equipment, they are going to get some damage, as you say, because it's March and we get a lot of mud. Right. That heavy equipment will really be, do a lot of damage. But I notice they're trying to go under the driveways. And in most instances, they're able to do that without any damage to the driveway. Right. And that makes business sense for them, naturally. It does, honestly. And I have one more question. It may be for Susan. I'm not positive. I thought we were going to put the budget on the website. Is that something we can do? We have basically never put the budget on the website. We've had it on our, um, our open checkbooks. Once we update it, we've had the budgets on there. Um, we can do it. It's no big deal after we get, after you pass it, we can certainly put it up there. It's not a problem. That way people could follow it. People that don't watch the meetings and probably do not copy down very quickly the things we we're saying. And sometimes we don't go over the whole thing. I know you do a very good job at it. I'm not saying that, but if that wouldn't be an inconvenience, I think if the other council members are in agreement, I think it might be a good idea. Yeah, I, I agree. Anything that we can put online is going to be helpful. All right. Anybody else? Um, and while we're talking about putting things online, if you don't mind me butting in, um, there was a, a, a inquiry that came across uh, this afternoon that we have been posting the agenda uh, on the uh, website and on Facebook, but we haven't posted the individual resolutions themselves. Uh, and, uh, and that's a good question. That's the first time anybody's asked. Because if we were in person, they, they'd be able to look at them, uh, and they don't have them here. So I've already talked to uh, Katie Smith, and uh, beginning with next week or with our next meeting, we will post in advance not just the agenda, but we'll also post the resolutions as well, so people can take a look at them uh, and see them if they got specific questions. Whether or not we're going to get into all the attachments on them, where it will remain to be seen. If we got something with thirty pages, I don't know if we're going to throw all that on there. Uh, you know, if somebody wants to see it, they can give us a call or something like that. But, uh, you know, if it's a proposal and, you know, it's attached as a, as a quote, of course, we'll put that stuff on. But the, but the resolutions and the ordinances themselves, we'll make sure those are all posted with the agenda starting with the next meeting. All right. Thank you, Paul. Anyone else? All right. I'm going to go ahead and call to order the City of New Franklin. City Council meeting Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. We'll call it 625. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance, allegiance. to the allegiance. flag allegiance. of the United, United States, States of America, America. And, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and, and justice for all. justice for all. All right, thank you. We get a roll call, please. Mr. Cox? Yes. Mr. Hargett? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Present. Mr. Fetterman? Here. Mr. Hawk? Here. Ms. Norris? Here. Mr. Stock? I think I caught care. Tell them something good. What about What? I, I don't know what that was. It wasn't me. <laughs> Something going, something going on. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and make a move, uh, motion to approve the minutes from the regular scheduled meeting of February 17th, 2021. Second. We got a second, any discussion, comments on the minutes? Mr. Hargett. Yes. Uh, you were not at the last meeting, so you would need to abstain. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. So I need, a, I need a second. 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 Thank All you. right, we got a person. Thank you, Kelly. Roll call, please. Was there any discussion, comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Hargett? Yes. You would abstain. Abstain, okay. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mr. Fetterman? Yes. Mr. Hawk? Yes. Ms. Norris? Yes. Mr. Stock? 
Yes. Mr. Cotts. Yes. All right, thank you. That passes six to zero with one abstention. We'll go on to the comments. We do have just a couple. Uh, we have one that says salaried positions in the private sector do not typically pay overtime. If the salary for the mayor has not increased in 20 years, then it's overdue. And another one said, hey, Jim, a few of us did comment. I'm guessing that's going back to when you put it on the website. So that was just a comment. And then uh, we got one, uh, something then the city should maintain the road white right away. That's always been an issue. Okay, we have another comment. Now that the governor is allowing mass gatherings with proper social distancing, will you return, were you returning to person, in-person meetings? And I guess I talked to Paul about that today. Paul, you just wanna to touch on that real quick? Yeah, we haven't gotten a, 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 a clearance on that specific issue. They, they've uh, increased the numbers for social gatherings, for festivals, for weddings, uh, but not uh, necessary, not for public meetings. So uh, I, I will continue to monitor that. And I really, really look forward to the day we're back out in the big room. Uh, but uh, as of right now, uh, all the information I have was we're still stuck with the uh, with the 10 person uh, limitation. All right, thank you, Paul. And another one is how long will Aqua guarantee their work digging on their driveway will cause voids and settling over time, causing concrete drives to settle and crack. I believe they put, Andy, you probably can help me. They push that through there, right? They usually don't excavate under a driveway. On a smaller pipe, they just push them through, right? So. I, I don't know what they're doing, but I know uh, as far as my company, yeah, we, we bore, it's directional bore, so there's no void. Yeah, that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that, I know that's what they do with smaller water line. I'm not sure what their main water line is, but I know they can do up to a pretty good size hole where they're, they're not actually excavating under there. They're just boring a hole and sticking a pipe to fill that void. So, but uh, that's a question. How long will they guarantee their work, Paul? Well, I mean, they've got an obligation to restore. So as long as we got a contract with them, I, I'm confident we'll be able to uh, uh, get their cooperation if there's uh, deterioration down the road. Okay. There's uh, there's quite a few driveways on Catalina where they've they've taken the driveway out, the apron out uh, to to install the piping. So uh, there, almost every driveway has been affected on on Catalina. All right. There we go. All right, that's all I see for now. All righty then, we're gonna go ahead and uh, again, we just have the one first reading, no second, third are pending. First reading of ordinance number 21-0-01, Kelly. An ordinance to increase the salary of mayor of New Franklin to 90,000 per year, effective January 1st, 2022. Thank you, Kelly. David, we discussed this during the committee meetings and it warrants uh, further discussion from the public, a little bit more meaningful discussion perhaps among us. It's not about Paul, it's about uh, having not done this for 20 years. Unfortunately, now that you do it and there's nothing that's been put into the legislative structure to allow for these increases yearly, which is maybe something we really should be considering. Um, we're gonna go ahead and keep that on time and explore this a little bit more. All right, time but, requested. But Paul, Paul, you're awesome. I think you're doing a great job. I have consistently been um, somebody that's spoken about your achievements and the hard work that you've done for this city not only in these meetings, but outside these meetings. Anytime I get, I always applaud your efforts. I think you're doing a great job. I'm trying, thank you. I, I agree, Andrea, thank you. Uh, time requested, time is granted. Thank you. Again, no second, third or pending. Moving into our favorite part of the meeting, which is the mayor's report. All right, here we go. Um, we talked about Aqua and it's moving forward. Uh, I had a meeting with the uh, city of Green today because the water is originates over by Giuseppe's and it has to come up uh, East Caston to, uh, to South Main and then it has to go South to uh, West Caston. And that's a busy intersection. 
and there's a lot going on there. Uh, and that's how we ended up having this conversation uh, that I was referring to with Summit County Sanitary Sewers, because, uh, well, in any event, uh, they are going to, it's, uh, they're going to need to close South Main for about five days. It'll be, it'll be a work week. It'll be sometime in, in um, probably mid-April. Uh, I know, and we will, uh, not much they can do about it uh, because they have to come around that corner and they have to, uh, th there's just a lot going on in that intersection. So uh, nobody really wants to, but they're going to have to. It's been done a few times before. Uh, the feeling is if we get plenty of early notice out on it, people are going to be inconvenienced. Uh, but fortunately, it's, uh, uh, it, it, there's nothing we can do about it. I'm just giving you an early heads up on it. Uh, that, it, to my knowledge, is the only road closure situation that we're going to look at during this uh, construction process. Um, we uh, put something out on our daily post a couple days ago. Uh, we've had some recent success with grants. And if people didn't look at that, uh, I just want to let the public know that we've been hustling after grants anywhere we can get them. Uh, and uh, three of them that we're happy to report, uh, the Justice Grant for Police Radios came in. Uh, and that's in the amount of $14,285. Uh, uh, and I think we asked for seven, they're paying for four. Um, but uh, we, that's almost $15,000 in grant money for those radios. The city share is $1,428. Uh, next, we, uh, there is a, I'm looking over to my left and there's this big uh, study that was done on the uh, Ohio and Erie Canal Way um, a connector. This has been discussed for a number of years of somehow connecting Nimasilla and the nice walking path they have in Nimasilla with the Portage Lake State Park and then also connecting the Portage Lake State Park with the Ohio uh, and Erie Canal Way uh, and uh, to maximize the uh, access uh, to, that, uh, to that trailway. So that study was done numerous years ago. It's a very expensive proposition to try to do all of it. We took a look at it and said, uh, you know, maybe this is a good time to look at uh, at the, the portion of it that would take it from the state park to the uh, to the uh, Erie Canal uh, to the uh, Canal Way and uh, towpath and uh, and we the reason we actually started looking at it because the sewer when the sewer comes they're going to be they're going to be off the road right away uh, and they're going to be doing some some digging and so when they restore maybe that could be restored as an all purpose path. Uh, and would really defer, you know, a lot of the expense. Um, so what we, the first thing that we needed to do was update this study from an engineering standpoint. And we talked to our people, GPD, and, and we, we got a rough idea of what it might cost. Uh, and uh, so we, we uh, applied for a grant for those, uh, uh, for a trail study uh, update on the towpath connector uh, study. And uh, we were advised on February 22nd, we were a successful applicant, $15,000. So uh, yeah, and the, and the beauty of that is, and we've talked with the uh, Ohio and Erie Canal Way Association people, and uh, oftentimes this is a sequential process that if they fund your study, uh, then that gives you points and puts you at an, it gives you an advantage when you come back and say, okay, now we'd like to do it and we'd like some funding for the project itself. And the fact that they funded the study gives you a leg up in, in getting the funding for the project. So um, that's something that we've been working on for a while and we got that. And uh, one, uh, we're very happy about that. And lastly, um, and Katie Smith, she's always embarrassed when I mentioned her, but uh, she um, took the lead at the Tudor House. And I'm gonna talk about the Tudor House in just a minute. Uh, but anything that needs to be done to structurally maintain the Tudor House. And, and, and I will tell you there's, there's not an iota of a plan to change anything about the interior of the Tudor house. The entire plan for the Tudor house is to maintain the period piece that it is. But we found out things like we had a leak in the, uh, in the butler's kitchen or the butler's pantry, or I don't know what you call it, but anyway, there was a leak in the ceiling and it was coming from a toilet. And this was last fall or last summer and uh, they dug it up and they, there was no plans. They have no, blue, no blueprints for this. Uh, and when they cut it open, they found out that the floor in the in that upstairs bathroom is concrete, pretty thick concrete. Uh, and then when you start seeing the pipes, it's a little scary. Um, and I will tell you as an aside, it's plenty scary 
you know, when I saw that, when I thought about what we might run into, what the city might run into for maintenance expenses, uh, you know, under the floors and behind the walls up there, because it was what, maybe two years ago, we had the, the ceiling in the bride's room um, give way. And we had to bring people in to fix that. So anyway, but there's no blueprints. Uh, and uh, uh, so we made that, we uh, reached out to uh, uh, the, the folks at Stan Hewitt, who, uh, who I should let Katie do it, but I'm not gonna, uh, it, because it, it, so who, who uh, understand old structures and blueprints, et cetera. <laughs> they said, before we could, what you guys need are blueprints. Uh, and we said, well, uh, <coughs> you know, how are we gonna get that done? Uh, and so it, Katie actually submitted the grant on our behalf to the Ohio History Connection. And we were one of, uh, I think we were one of what, 18 or 14? <coughs> yeah, we were one of 14 that received a grant, in this case, just under $5,000 uh, to assist us then in, in creating the, uh, recreating the blueprints for, for the Tudor house. So uh, uh, all told, uh, it was a, uh, you know, about $35,000 in grants that came in. So it's, it's a lot of hard work and it's very much appreciated by, the, by all the folks that made that happen. Um, the Kungal Road Bridge, uh, here's the latest. Uh, there was, um, when we last spoke, there were discussions going on with, the, with AMATS. <clears throat> it's such a complicated deal that that if the if the Summit County engineer applied to AMATS for for the money, AMATS had the money, uh, but the engineer had to apply, uh, and then Norton was talking about trying to make up the balance, uh, and all of this was the idea to try to get this done this year, and so that's where we were the last time I talked to you. Um, two things happened actually today. Uh, one of them, I followed up on it in advance of this meeting. Uh, the AMATS thing is is not moving as quickly as anybody would like it to. Um, the engineer has, this is all secondhand, so I don't want to speak for the engineer, but I'm advised that the engineer has a number of projects they want to apply for AMATS funding. And if they, you know, and they, they're prioritizing at their end, and this may not be a high priority item. And so maybe they don't want to push this one through AMATS. So I was prepared for that possibility. And if that happens, we're just going to pound the county more and pound Norton. But meanwhile, um, we, uh, we're uh, in touch today. I had two phone call conversations today with Senator, uh, State Senator Christina Rogner, and she is our state senator. She also happens to be the chair of the uh, Senate Finance Committee, which is a, and, and the capital budget is, is in the process of being reviewed and, and approved. Uh, and the final approval will come by the end of this month. Uh, and uh, we talked to her today about the uh, Kungle Road Bridge. And she had she was interested, uh, and and had a, uh, uh, and so I spoke to her at the end of the day, and she has committed to make a request in the budget for two hundred thousand dollars for that project, and yeah, which would cover, I think most of that project. Um, Norton has some ideas. There's going to be some development on Eastern Road, which is going to be a really good thing for us because we need that anyway. Uh, but, uh, and, and so they want to do a little bit more than just the bridge. I'm thrilled with that, but all we really care about right now is the bridge. So, uh, the short of it is she is, she's made, she's including that in, in the, uh, in their application for the budget and we'll know by March 31st. And if it's approved, then that money is available. And I followed up then with, uh, with, uh, Norton, the representative from Norton, uh, and said, if that money comes in, is, is this bridge going to be done this summer? And the answer was yes. So um, we're hopeful. Uh, all right. Uh, the, uh, the Tudor House, uh, I, I sent everybody a copy of the proposal. Uh, as you know, we, we advertised multiple, multiple places. Uh, and we had, we had one proposal from the same individual who had the original interest. Uh, and, uh, and if you've had a chance to look at the proposal, good. And if you haven't, what you'll see is uh, very similar to what the, the, kind of what we asked for, uh, a willingness to, to take over the house, take over the maintenance of the house in terms of the development of the grounds, take over the bookings and be responsible for all that. In terms of development of the grounds, um, the proposal is, you know, at one time we talked about a structure down by the lake, but then we had some pushback on that. 
people weren't too crazy about that idea. Uh, so the proposal, as you as you probably saw, uh, it is, would be in two phases. The first phase would involve the landscaping, and that landscaping would include uh, patios uh, on the lake side of the house, patios at the north entranceway, and lakefront patios. Uh, and also some, some work on the waterfront down there, um, the uh, work on the driveway to create a circular driveway, installation of a permanent outdoor restroom on the facility. Um, the, uh, the, uh, I've had some extensive conversations with the individual, well, Tim Canner, who, who made the proposal, uh, and they expect that, uh, that phase to cost in the range of $500,000. Uh, the construction on that would begin, uh, they, they would do the design work during the year and they would look to start the construction at the end of this, it, it, this fall and be done by next spring with that phase of it. Uh, they would run the wedding season through 2022. Uh, they would use tents as we've used tents. Uh, and then the second phase would be the <clears throat> season room with the idea that the construction on that would start in the fall, early winter of 2022. And that structure would be ready by the spring, uh, the red wedding season of 2023, two years from now. Um, and it, when, if you look at that, uh, at those plans, what really attractive about that house and the house would go to the north side of the, uh, of the uh, grounds. Uh, so there's no site issues. Um, it's, it's, he's, the plans include a two-story structure and the, and the top floor would have walkouts, uh, lakefront walkouts. Uh, and that's great because they'll be able to do their weddings and events up there. The, 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 the ground floor, I'm even more excited about quite frankly, because they have some storage areas in there, but there's two meeting rooms in there. Uh, and, and I, you know, that's been, that's an important aspect for me in terms of how the city can have an opportunity to use that facility. Um, the, um, so we are in the process and that, that part of the process, project they expect to cost somewhere between one and a half to $2 million to, to build that building. Um, there was a question I talked to our parks commission about this the other day and they had a question of, well, how do we control the events they have and, and how are they gonna pay for this? And, and uh, is he gonna have to start running all kinds of different events to, to pay the bills? Uh, and and the, the financing, it's private financing. He, sh you know, it's, it, it, he shared some details with me. Um, they will not have any debt service uh, to answer to for the, until the third year. So that's how they're, that's, that's how they're, how they, that, that's the business plan. And what will eventually happen is, you know, we try to book weddings out there. I don't know how we booked anything, quite frankly, the longer I look at the place, to be honest with you. But you know, if you book a wedding out there and, and you pay the fifteen hundred dollars for the house, which used to be seven fifty, uh, and then you got a tent, uh, and it, uh, in the tent, uh, you know, they would come put the tables up. But if you wanted tables anywhere else, you wanted your chairs, you had to come, you had to take them out of the garage, drag them up, set them up. At the end of it, you got to take them down. I know that happens at certain places, but that's how you that's how you rent it for fifteen hundred. That's how we ended up with you know with uh, those were the the folks we got. They'll do a little bit more upscale. Uh, and I think they, you know, apparently their business plan is such they feels that they'll be able to uh, have rentals that'll sustain it. Um, we had, uh, so I'm working on the contract. We're working on the contract right now. And I hope to have that contract to present to you for a first reading on March 17th. And I will tell you that the operative parts, um, they would take over the obligation of the bookings. They would, they would run them. They would service them. Um, the, uh, uh, they take over the maintenance of the house as soon as we sign the contract. Uh, their plan is we, we met over there with the house committee. We got subcommittees of the Tudor House Commission now because we've had such good response. And, and we met with him, the house committee met last Friday with him and we went kind of room to room. Uh, and, and Tim indicated they'll probably spend about 75 or $85,000 this year in the house just doing fundamental stuff. A couple of the bathrooms are a nightmare. You've been over there, you know that. Uh, what passes for a groom's room in the basement is scary. 
you know, there's there's just a there's there's a lot of stuff that's very expensive. And, and I'm sorry to go on this long, but I really want to let people understand why I, I feel so strongly about this. These are things when we when we expanded the Tudor House Committee Commission and we created these separate committees. And Andrea can speak to that. Her and her mom came in and did some fabulous stuff in one of the rooms. Uh, we took a look and we said, OK, we're going to do this piece by piece. And we look at the kitchen and we spent some money and we had a lot of donated labor and we upgraded that kitchen. But when you start getting into some of the other rooms and some of the things that need to be done, I mean, it's 5,000 here, 10,000 here, 15,000 here. Uh, and then, you, you know, it, it, it's, it was very, very, very daunting. Uh, and, and then you're going to take the small administrative staff that we have and say, OK, to pay for this, we're really going to have to do more stuff. We got to get corporate events in here. We got to get, you know, and all of a sudden we're trying to run an event center uh, and, you know, with, with no manpower. Uh, and we still don't have anybody to put up tables and take them down. So uh, th this, there is an, it, so the contract is such that, that we preserve the dates. We preserve our five uh, major event dates. We preserve biweekly summer events and we have the right to the facility at any time that it's not booked and that at any time that it's not booked, it remains open as a public park place. Uh, and we, this is going to be a management agreement. There's no proprietary interest. We, we, we retain the full proprietary interest in the grounds. So uh, that's, um, that's most of the high points on it. Uh, I, will, uh, I will get this to you uh, in advance of the meeting. And, uh, and we, I intend to have it, and we gotta, I think we'll have it hammered out in time to have it uh, to you for at least a first reading uh, on March 17th. Um, I know I was really kind of long-winded on that one. Have anybody got any questions or, or thoughts or concerns or comments on that one? I do, Paul, I'm sorry. Yeah. This reminds me, Mason Manor, this was the reason we did not take Mason Manor. We couldn't afford it. Exactly. I remember we had, I think a bat incident. Right. And that was just one incident. Yeah. But this is the, that's the reason we did not, that we don't have Mason Manor. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. Uh, just a couple other things quickly. We are proceeding on, on uh, exploring tennis courts at Sisler. Uh, we've, I've talked with Manchester schools. Uh, they will, um, they'll donate the land to us. We're doing the survey right now. Uh, we're talking with the uh, United States Tennis Association. They're going to help us with the planning. Uh, we will, Kevin Noble's working on this. We're going to put out requests for proposals for construction. Uh, and uh, as soon as we are in a position to do that, which we hope will be, uh, we think we should have everything, it will hopefully before the end of April, we'll be able to get proposals for cost. Uh, and then what we also intend to do is make application with ODNR for a grant for as much of this as we can get. We, we, went after, we went after a grant from them for a uh, pavilion up there at Sisler, which got turned down. And I'm really not shocked that it did, all things considered. Uh, but we think this has a lot of viability. Uh, and we, we, we really think that we got a good shot at a grant on this because we're also gonna do the pickleball courts. And it's, it's so we've got you know, the, the attraction that for the entertainment for the young, entertainment for the old, it's the kind of thing I think that has a lot of magic for, for uh, grants. Uh, so we will see uh, what we can what we can muster up for grants. Uh, one of the other upsides of, uh, of getting out from under the financial obligation of the Tudor House is we won't have a financial obligation for the Tudor House. And so the 150,000 that we have coming in each year of the portion of the income tax that has to go to parks uh, can now be used for some for some other purposes. Uh, and uh, specifically, the Parks Commission, as, as I've told you, is, is committed to, to this project. Um, and so we would be dedicating a significant uh, portion of the, of the park budget um, over the next few years to, to, to get this done. Um, Paul, I apologize. I have sure. another question. Would yeah. this mean an amendment to change that then for our income tax? Oh, no. Okay. No, 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 no. It just says it has to, that 5% has to go to parks. Parks. Yeah. And it says primarily for capital projects. And then if you, you can also use it for other purposes, um, but uh, it's primarily for capital projects just like this. Uh, the uh, uh, the, S, the South Summit COG is, is meeting and proceeding and uh, May 11th right now is the target date. 
to uh, to go live with that joint venture. So uh, that's that's moving along its course. Uh, everybody involved at this end in our safety forces and our dispatch people are all excited about that and still 100% behind it. Um, and let me see, lastly, uh, the financial disclosure statements to the Ohio Ethics, if it didn't hit your radar, uh, May 17th is the deadline on that. So um, I, don't, I, I used to get a note, I don't think I got a notice this year. Uh, and anyway, I was going through an old file and I found it. And I, Susan probably said something to us a while back. But uh, anyway, we all got to file one. So it's due May 17th. That's just a reminder. That's all I got. All right. Thank you, Paul. Move into finance, Susan. Just can you hear me? Yes. There we go. Sometimes it doesn't click on me. Um, we are this last week and this week, the mayor and I are meeting with the department heads to go over the annual appropriations. Uh, we've got one more meeting tomorrow. And then once uh, we get everybody's numbers by Friday, you should have your um, spreadsheet with the draft, uh, draft appropriations on it. And then as soon as that, as soon as you have a copy of that, I will make it into the for form of a resolution. So if you have any questions, once you receive that in your email, please look it over and let me know if there's any questions or if you wanna talk to that de the department heads as well, um, since they're the ones that are in on the meeting with us and, and go through everything line by line, uh, feel free. But if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, if you'd rather have a, uh, a hard copy um, you will get a hard copy of the resolution, of course, but if you'd rather have a hard copy yeah. of the spreadsheet, let me know. We can print that out and put it in your uh, folder back there too, whichever you'd prefer. That's all I've got for right now. All right. Thank you, Susan. Old business? Any old business? I wanted Just, to bring up about um, digital, getting our ordinances put in online, If it, what kind of work has been done on that or if we were still doing that. That is... Still, I apologize for my back. That's still on the radar. Uh, and I don't mean to keep putting it off. I mean, we haven't forgotten about it. Um, it's in to, to be, it, it's probably a next year project to be, to be honest with you, Mr. Fetterman. But when I say that, I mean it, uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll have, the deck should be cleared enough that we can get at that. It, kind of somewhat similar to that is is trying to go digital with all of our paper records and if you've been in that back room you see what a nightmare that is with everything that we store with paper and it's going to take a lot of work to get ready so those are two different projects but but uh they're sort of under the in my mind it's the same thing i if we can get at it sooner this fall we certainly will uh uh and um and as we mentioned before uh I haven't, I don't know, I can't, I don't know the specific sites, but it's been suggested that there might be uh, some, potentially some grant money available uh, for that type of thing. There was some suggestion maybe you could use CARES money, but I thought that was a little bit of a long shot. Uh, but um, uh, so I know that we need it and it, it, we need our, we need to, we need a code. <laughs> uh, we should have a traffic code. We should have a criminal code. We will have that. Uh, we just, I just haven't been able to get at it yet. Thank you. Any other old business? Uh, a couple things, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you mentioned pickleball. When will the uh, pickleball court open up at uh, Lakeside? Uh, boy, as soon as weather permits. Um, and I, I'm looking for today. volunteers to do the, to do the introductory, uh, introductory game. So if you're interested, but yeah, as soon as, the, as soon as the weather is good, uh, we've got the paint. Uh, and we've got the posts. It's just a matter of, uh, and the surface is there. So we just got to stripe it and sink the posts and get the nets up and get it going. So uh, I, I would hope uh, right around the beginning of April. Excellent. Okay. And um, uh, the uh, community involvement group uh, and, and Grill, Grill Park, uh, any updates on that? Uh, yeah, the uh, yeah, Citizens Advisory Group. We had a nice meeting. Um, and boy, it's, I, I lose the sequence of some of these things. I, yeah, we met with them right after the last meeting that we had. And we had about 20, 22 people uh, and uh, really a, a good exchange of information. 
uh, with a, a pretty broad range of expertise. Um, and uh, what has come out of that as much as anything, I think I copied you folks on this. Um, we, you know, we wanted to get the information out in terms of what we're doing, why we're trying to do it. And, and also part of it is, and this is a slow process and I wanted people to be aware of that as well. Uh, nothing's happening next week in terms of uh, this, but, uh, but get them in on the ground floor uh, and, and get input from folks. Uh, we, we referenced the comprehensive plan, which was adopted in 2004. Uh, and uh, it, and I, I think it still has a lot of viability because as I pointed out to them, there hasn't been a whole lot changed up here since 2004. Uh, the city looks largely the way it did back then. Uh, and uh, because we've had no infrastructure. So, um, uh, but it was suggested that it wouldn't be, a, this would be a good time for an update of the comprehensive plan. And uh, that was a good suggestion. So uh, I am, uh, I've got a, a, a Zoom meeting next Thursday with the Pogemeyer group. And those are the folks that did the comprehensive plan. Uh, and we're gonna talk with them about, the, you know, get some input from them about what their thoughts are uh, and uh, uh, what, what costs might be. And then from there, uh, we, we will likely, I expect that we're gonna do a request for proposals to not just Pogemeyer, but to other groups for an update of the comprehensive plan. And we'll come to council with that, uh, you know, once uh, I'll probably be coming to you with that sometime in, in April, uh, asking for this request for proposals. Because uh, I really think it would, I think it is time. Uh, it, I don't think it's gonna take a lot, but, but uh, so that, that group is up off and running and, and they, boy, they, they got good ideas. So I think it's, it's a good group. Um, uh, as far as, we did have a few people that responded. They had some interest in, in, in sharing some ideas uh, on Grill Park. Uh, three or four, Katie, would you say? Three, okay. We have not, I haven't gone any further with that one yet. Uh, so um, I gotta get back to that. But I, it, you know, I, I did hear from their baseball folks and then we did tell them by all means, use it for youth baseball as you did in the past. And I also invited them to let us know whatever they might need in terms of grooming or uh, assistance from our service department. I haven't heard back from them, but uh, so I think for this year, it's just, it's still gonna be a youth baseball field and, and down the road, we'll have to see what, you know, what we might wanna do out there. All right, any other okay, old business? You. Oh, you got something, Jim? Just the courtesy of saying thank you. All right, all righty. Any other old business? How about new business? Any new business? All right, we're going into our public questions and answers. And actually, this is what I'm gonna bring up the email. So get yourself some popcorn and a soda because this is gonna be a little while. But I do have, uh, there was one that says, I mean, Sue, you might know, it says Anderson Online or American Legal can handle the digital ordinance issues. Paul's shaking his head. Yeah. All right. And we got another one. Uh, he left his Ken Payne, 5972 Manchester Road. So it's been eight or nine months since it was discussed about ordinances online, but April Pickleball will be open. Well, it's two different things, I'm guessing. It says the priorities, but. One's a little more uh, detailed than the other, I would say, Paul, as far as that goes. All right, here we go. As far as the contractor registration, I was gonna kind of wait and you know let it go for a while till we we're all together, but I'm gonna address some of these issues. Some people are sort of anxious to hear some, or I'm just gonna answer some questions. I got one that's pretty long, so I'm gonna have to reduce it a little bit for the four minute time. The first one is gonna be, uh, this is from Robin Akey. Uh, Mr. Stock, I am writing you in regards to the comments at several city council meetings proposed legislation under registration of contractors working in the city of New Franklin. Without its own building department, the city of New Franklin follows the guidelines, requirements, and standards as defined by the Summit County Building Department and Building Standards Department. As such, contractor res registration already exists, and there's a link to it. Yet you feel the necessity to add additional registration requirements, fees, city personnel duties to register and monitor contractors. Uh, what prompts this legislation? Uh, I was thinking about, we have a vendor's permit that we require 
people to have. So I, I started looking at that. I'm like, well, what, you know, maybe something along the lines of knowing who our contractors are doing business. And the next question is who is requesting the city to register contractors? Is it residents or just you? Again, I was feeling the, you know, doing some research and I'm like, well, with the vendor's permit, maybe we look into that. So I just, I thought maybe we, you know, we felt the need. And then it says, and there's a question about how many uh, new president, new Franklin residents have filed complaints on contractors in the last several years. I talked to Barry, he has none, but I have not checked the Better Business Bureau or I did talk to the county today, but as one question, I did not ask them. And uh, during the meeting, 17th meeting, council, uh, you express your reason for legislation as to who is working in our community, protect our citizens and provide a level playing field for contractors. So then we go to reason number one, seeing who's working in our community. You stated if you work in our community, you're gonna be insured and bonded. As the term contractor applies to many workers who provide a service, your statement and proposed legislation should also apply to lawn care service, babysitters, CPAs, attorneys, mechanics, mask makers, et cetera, to just name a few. Will your contractor registration requirement apply to all who provide a service or residents in your plan in your planning to only discriminate towards construction contractors? Now I'm gonna refer back to if we have one, it would be on the lines with the Summit County contractor registration types. And I'm gonna read through those real quick. Is communication wiring, low voltage, alarm, security, vacuum, et cetera. Demolition, electrical, fire alarm, fire suppression, general con contractor, concrete, excavator, home builder, roofing, siding, and signs, HVAC, fireplace, kitchen hood, mechanical, hydronic, kitchen hood suppression, medical gas, plumbing, refrigeration, underground fire main, and other as required by the chief building official. And all those need uh, state licensing certificates except for uh, communication wiring, demolition, and general contractor. Everyone else of those needs a uh, state license. So that would answer that question. And I might look into maybe looking into some, some of them have for companies that cut trees down because kind of think it's important that somebody's, you know, doing tree work at your house is, uh, has some kind of insurance before they're cutting your trees down. <clears throat> okay, and it says, you feel registering contractors will provide protection to new Franklin citizens. This is a noble ideal idea, but will not prevent poor workmanship or performance. Well, actually the, either does the Summit County Board the building department, they don't check for workmanship. As long as it meets the state minimum requirements, it can, it, it'll pass. So you can have your house built and get your final inspection for your occupancy permit. And it could be a terrible finish job, trim job. You have open, you know, open miters. They're not looking for that. As long as it's on, that's all that matters. So as far as, you know, prevent poor workmanship or performance, that doesn't do it. Even the county doesn't do that. The performance possibly. Each citizen should be able to select a contractor of their choice who meets their desired credentials, service level, and expectations. As it is their choice, the citizens assume some accountability, risk, and responsibility. And if, and if something should go wrong or fail to meet the desired outcome, each citizen currently has several public and private options available to settle any disputes and or recover damages. Do you really feel the need for New Franklin to add another level, level of bureaucracy to a citizen's choice. Well, a citizen can pick whoever they want. They, they're, they're contrasting. And another thing, I've been doing some talking, talked to Barry, Summit County Building Inspector, even with the mayor, this would be a no fee registration. It, it was never was about the money. So it would be a no fee registration. And I'll get to that one after I give you some information about talking to the chief building inspector at uh, the Summit County. So it'd be a free, a free uh, registration. So it, it wouldn't be, you know, no, no fee required. <clears throat> okay, create a level playing field for contractors. If a citizen wants to deal with only insured and bonded contractor, it's their choice. Well, it's already, if, if a contractor is gonna work in Summit County, he legally has to be, meet the Summit County requirement, which he has to be insured and bonded before he pulls a, a building permit. So that wouldn't be, had, that's already in place. If a citizen wants to select a relative, friend, neighbor, church member, or anyone of their choosing, it's their choice. The selection of a contractor is between a citizen and contractor, which becomes a working relationship between all parties. I get that. 
That's fine if a homeowner wants to pull their own permits and do their own work. That's no problem. But there's some contractors that'll let the homeowner pull all their permits and then do the job. And I mean, I've seen it. I've been in a, a lot of, I'm, I'm not a contractor, but I worked in the re residential field for 12 years. And I've seen where contractors have the homeowner go and pull all their permits, but they actually do the work. So that's, that's something that even the building inspector says goes on and it's hard for them to police that all the time. And it says this legislation will be limited to the pool of contractors available for citizens to select from. It will also limit the number of residents who desire to make extra income to support their families. Why do you want to turn New Franklin into a punitive city? It is not a, it's not the government's role to establish a level playing field for businesses. I have a couple points on that. This isn't about the handyman or the neighbor kid that's painting your fence. It's about an actual contractor. And as far as a level playing field as a city, we do that already with other businesses. We have an income tax. So if business A and business B sell the same product, but we go ahead and let business A not pay, pay any city income tax, of course they can have a cheaper product. So why would you go to B? So we that level playing field is, that's something that's already in place with all, all over the country. That's how they level playing field a lot of different things by having some kind of requirements that everybody has to follow, which makes it level. So that I addressed that there. And it says, Mr. Stock, as a contractor yourself, it is inappropriate and a conflict of interest for you to establish requirements for re registering contractors in New Franklin. I'm not a contractor. I've never been a contractor. I've been a carpenter for over 35 years, 12 of that in the residential, and the last almost 24 years as a commercial that I work for somebody. I'm a union carpenter. I am not a contractor. This would not affect me one bit. <clears throat> so this proposed legislation is another example of government overreach by controlling the number of contractors available to New Franklin residents under the disguise of protection. No, because they already have to register with the county to pull build, building permits. So they have to already prove that they're insured and bonded. Uh, so, and then she don't, and another thing that I did some research and the difference is around 30% of a contractor that pays his licenses, not his license, but pays his insurance, pays his workman's comp, pays his insurance to his employees, and is bonded is about a 30% difference between him and the guy that's just paying his workers as subcontractors that's not licensed or not licensed, but not uh, paying uh, insurance or is bonded. So that, that's an unlevel playing field right there. So the guy doing it right's been at some points or been against guys that are can go 30% less than him. And that might save the, the homeowner some money, but he ain't doing it 30% less. He's doing it for 25% less and pocketing that money. So that addresses that letter. How's everybody doing? We bored yet? Because I'm going to get through this. All right. So that's one. We got one here from uh, Mark Sedlock. <clears throat> As a small business owner in a community, I'd like to offer my opinion on the idea of a contractor registration ordinance. While my business would not be affected, I can offer some insight from my perspective as a business owner and fiscal conservative. Please pass these comments on during the next city council meeting. Well, I understand desire of part of the elected officials to protect their citizens from unscrupulous, unscrupulous <clears throat> operators. I feel there are better ways of doing so than another tax, which is what a registration fee is. Most small businesses operate on a very tight margin and add another tax burden on them is neither appropriate nor justified to me as a taxpayer. Again, I would propose that there is no fee. And I've talked to Barry for what he would do maybe up to 80 of them a year, that would not be a problem to fill out a small form to register our contractors with no fee. Having a contractor registration system also implies that the city will be responsible for vetting those contractors and ultimately responsible for the conduct of the registered. I do not believe that to be true from my research with other communities. It's not, we're not, all we're saying is they have presented us with their insurance and a bond. That's it. As a double hit, taxpayers in the city, I pay both personal and business tax I don't like the idea of an ordinance that puts the tax revenue collected from me in potential jeopardy from legal suits brought by consumers harmed by registered contractors. And there is, in my, there is no indication that that would ever happen from the research I've done, but I will check again with our law director. Moving on. There's a time-honored adage, caveat emptor, Latin for let the buyer beware. 
It should be up to the individual looking to hire a contractor to ver verify whether that contractor is bonded and or has sufficient insurance to cover any losses caused by the contractor. They should also ask for references, previous customers, and follow up by contacting those references. A phone call or, or website check with a Better Business Bureau can always identify those. Well, I'm, I'm sure we all understand there's always a scam going on. And we have an older population and there are some of them that don't have access to that. My mom actually called me today and says, I'll be getting it. I will get an email because she signed up for something that somebody solicited her on the phone. She's 85. I got I mean, I, I got to look into it, but there's some of them, they can just talk to them and they'll say, oh, OK, well, you know, yeah, let's do this. If the issue here is residents calling a city for contractor recommendations, which is not uh, the fact then a quick response of a previous caution should suffice along with an explanation that the city cannot recommend vendors for legal reasons. It would, be not a, it would not be a recommendation. An additional suggestion that in a small community, word of mouth advertising carries a lot of weight and that there are many online services that identify contractors for all type of work. Again, it's not a recommendation, it's just a registration. And we all know that there's a, a large population that don't have access to the computers, don't use the computers. So that's one thing. The individual does not need the government to look out for them. This only leads to bigger and bigger government. With its intending increased demand for revenue and a larger and larger tax burden on individuals. I don't believe that that's the case either. That's fine for most people, but like I said, there's always some scams and there's, there's government offices that help people from that. And if everybody was honest, you know, we got speed limit signs, we, we wouldn't need anybody to enforce any of our laws because everybody just is that honest, but there's contractors that are not that honest. So, I mean, if the government determines that it wants to assess in protecting its constituents from unscrupulous contractors, then maybe it should do so via a public information campaign, mailing bulk mail or advisory statement. All right, I hope I answered them questions. Does anybody have any questions for me? at this point. All right, we're getting into one more. Let me get a drink of coffee here. Okay, and this is from Kevin Powell, Swigert Road. I'm gonna go through some of his, his is very long. He's got a section that I will ask that I'm not gonna take care of at this point, but I will answer all his questions. All right, in, re in reference to some of your comments addressing potential contractor registration during the new business section, of the council meeting that took place on 2-17-21. I felt some clarification was needed regarding correspondence I sent from the meeting to three. Further, I want to address some of the misinformation you may have been given. During the meeting, you referenced my letter around 56 minutes into the meeting, and I got the impression that your comments, you thought the term skilled trade only referred to state caliber licensing. My text from the letter reads as follows: notes for the places I have registered, such as Summit County, Barberton, Stark County, Portage, County, Stowe, et cetera. The purpose of registering is the skilled trades to have their work inspected. This is especially important for the trades that require state licensing. This comment has two separate statements and was dif differing between non-licensed and licensed skilled trades. Although both are important, some require additional qualifications and requirements. I had went on to describe the insurance and bonding requirement for said licensing. You are correct in the fact general contractors, worker siders, and other trades do not need a state license, but don't think you realize all construction trades are required to be registered with the Summit County Board and Building Standards. Actually, Summit County contract registration form attached it. This means that the state license trade, general contract roofing site, and window installers must have the same minimum insurance and bonding. In addition, they are required to pull permits and get inspections on each job they perform. This is a mechanism that protects residents and by the county having licensed qualification inspectors on staff, they have legal backing to take action against contractors if the work is not performed to standards. You mentioned if you are going to work in our community, you are to be insured and bonded. This is already a requirement of the community since Summit County Standards is authority to have jurisdiction if the contractor is doing work in an area. The county building department has jurisdiction, New Franklin in parentheses, and they are not registered contractors and do not have insurance and bond. They are working illegally and would face fines and penalties. As someone that does not does follow the rules and registers when where needed, I agree it would be nice to have a level playing field, but if contractors are not following the county's registration rules, they would not follow <clears throat> New Franklin's. Realistically, all you're doing is increasing costs, how minor it is on small businesses, which will ultimately be passed on to the consumer, customer. 
Okay, regarding your comment about 58 minutes into the meeting, you state that if you were doing roof for a couple of days, you would not have to pay taxes. I'm sure that is exactly an accurate, not sure that's an accurately, an accurate statement. When doing taxes, businesses have a profit and loss from form they have to fill out for each entity. If I have a large electrical job and I profit 3,000 in two days, you're saying New Franklin would not want their share of the taxes due. If, if this is true, who do I contact for my refund? And Sue, I talked to you about that today. Can you brief on that? And I'll, I'll, I'll just, while we're there, can you just give a brief summary on how that works as far as the taxes and that real quick? We're talking, can you hear me? When we were talking, we were talking about uh, the workers and, and workers that come into the city. And um, after, after 20, 20 days, the 21st day is when we start uh, taking income tax from them for the workers there. But, but unless we know that these people are there, um, you know, that Rita knows that they're there, obviously we're not gonna be able to tax them. Um, some businesses of course are honest, some not so much, but um, as the mayor can attest to when they were putting in the pipeline, we check, he met with them and he, we made sure we gave that information to Rita so that, so that we did collect those taxes. But obviously, and I'm sure the mayor can attest to this as well, if, if we don't know about somebody that's there and we're not advised or Rita's not advised, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know and they would not get taxed. And like you were saying, it's easy for Rita, if you're a New Franklin resident, they see, they'll look and see you paid state tax and federal tax. And if, since we have the tax, they would kind of look in to see where you work to where you paid your taxes. So they look into that a little bit, but if you're not a New Franklin resident, they don't, they don't do that kind of research to try to track somebody down. And like, again, it's not a big deal about that, but it, it is fair to say that you could work here for a few days, 10 days, and if you weren't tracked by uh, living here and, you know, so they could see that if you lived somewhere else, they, they would have no idea you were here. So, in, you know, you would not pay any tax to New Franklin City for up to right. 20 days. If, and they, even after that, if we don't know they're there, they're there, they won't, they don't have to, they have to pay the tax, but the chances is nobody would be able to track them down. Correct? That's, that's correct. That would, that is very high possibility. Okay. All right, so then I'm going to bypass this. This is getting pretty long. There's some, uh, there's a paragraph about who is contracted with Summit County Building, who is contract, uh, who's not contracted, who's contracted. There's several communities. I didn't really look into everyone to see which ones were which. So I'm going to bypass that. Sorry, Kevin, we're getting into this pretty long, but you can post that on your Facebook page and let the people see it. Okay, here we go. In closing, I understand what your intentions are and what you're trying to accomplish. I also believe that you have the best intentions at heart. Personally, if there is another registration to deal with, it's just a matter of filling out paperwork and paying the fee. I do, however, disagree with the additional insurance and bonding, which there would be no additional insurance bonding. It was just proved that you carry what you're carrying for the county. That's all. That's no nothing additional. And I think you're setting yourself up for legal issues down the road. I would appreciate if you answer the following questions, some of which are from last email. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> and like I said, the legal issues, I'll have to check with ours, but all the ones I've been checking into, there, there, it, it doesn't seem that there's no legal issue to, for you to have, if somebody calls and says, is this contractor registered? You look and say, and Barry says it's, it's, it's very easy to accomplish that. If somebody calls, he just looks it on their computer and says, yes, they're registered. It'll be a free registration. So it's uh, here's the first question. You have mentioned you are not trying to reinvent the wheel and it's to protect the residents, but the wheel already exists. What further protections are you offering that the county does not already have in place? They require registration, insurance, bonding. They also require permits and inspection. Well, I had a nice discussion with uh, Chris Randalls, the chief building, and, uh, chief building official with the county of Summit. We talked, you know, I told him I was looking into doing like a, a separate contractor registration and he you know he realized Akron has it and they're you know they use the Summit County Building Department and I'm sure Akron has a building department but they use it and one of the discussions was you know I told him that I talked to some people which would be you know I ran it by uh, Paul and Barry about not even having a fee and he said that he, he thinks that's you know good because he don't believe that Akron they have a fee he thinks since they paid the county fee they sh you know shouldn't have another fee 
So I would decide that that would go to the wayside. I wasn't worried about that. So, and what he had to say about it was, you know, he didn't have a problem at all. As long as we were not trying to enforce a building code to him, it was a good idea because it's more boots on the ground. He said, there's a lot of, he knows that there's jobs going on that they, they don't get to. Summit County is a big area and he don't have a problem. And then Barry and them do that. And I talked to Barry and I was, I knew that we kind of did some stuff, but Barry said, you know, our building enforcer, zoning enforcer is on the road almost eight hours a week. And he will stop it if he sees something going on. If this, not even if it's a call, he, he stops and checks on it. So what I was telling, you know, Barry was talking, I'm like, well, if we have a building, so what happens is our building, our zoning enforcer will call Barry and say, hey, this address, so-and-so, Barry gets right up, punches it in on his computer and it comes up that they are, have a zoning permit and a building permit, okay? <clears throat> and he said all he would have to do, and Barry's in favor too, all he'd have to do is put another column in there that says, yeah, they're registered. So, and actually, when this, when he's driving around, Bill's driving around, he calls Barry. Barry goes, yeah, they got all the X's. So, he just moves on. So, that's that's one thing <clears throat> that Barry said would be good for him. He don't have a problem with, you know, writing it. We'll get into that. He says he does about an average 150 permits a year. About 60% of those are contractors and the other 40% are homeowners. So he said maybe about 80 contractors that actually pull permits. So he would have to write 80 and it would be a simple form, you know, just to put us on there. So right now we're not costing anybody any money. We're not even gonna charge us a small fee. Cause even if you charge a small fee, it would be for a whole year. So say it was $25. If you did 25 jobs, you would have to charge each person a dollar more to recoup your money. So I don't even think that's an issue but I would go with no, no fee whatsoever. So as far as that goes, the Summit County building inspector has no problem with us if we had our own registration. And then it said, since we've had heard numerous times about the limited staffing, who will enforce the said registrations? Again, Barry said, there is no extra manpower needed. He does the office stuff. Our zoning would just be doing what he does on an average of eight hours now, he said, once we get into the spring, he'll be on the road more often because there's more activity once the weather gets nice. So as far as that goes, enforcing it, and plus we always have the, the, the residents. Barry says if somebody's building a fence, usually gets a call right away. Somebody's saying, hey, they're building a fence. Do they have a permit? You know, So a lot of that's from our residents. So we're, gonna have, that's, we're not going to have somebody have to hire somebody special to take care of that. We already have people in place. And how will it be funded? Again, very, no extra hours, no extra time. So there's no extra funds needed. Uh, what will new, will new Franklin stop utilize, utilizing Summit County building standards and open their own building department? Absolutely not. Akron, Cauga Falls, Lakemore and others have closed their building departments and contracted with the county due to the cost of registration and permits not covering the cost of service. No, like I, I pretty much put it all out there. I mean, it's, to me, it's something I'm still like to look into. Uh, a couple other things with talking to uh, a Summit County building official, chief building official. <clears throat> like people are supposed to, if, if you put a, if you get your roof tore off and get a roof put on, you are supposed to, you don't need a zoning permit, but you need a building permit. Now, if you put all new replacement windows in your house, as long as you're not changing the openings, you don't need a building permit. So as far as that registered contractor, the Summit County don't even know they're putting windows in some of these, uh, one of our elderly couples here in New Franklin, Summit County don't even know they're here. Okay, so they're putting windows in, they don't need a building, they don't need zoning or building. And as long as they don't change the openings, that they're under, they're just going to go deal with that customer and that's it. Nobody knows they're here. They can come and go as they please. I would think that the actual contractors, a few that I know that do up there by the books, they have no problem. They didn't even have a problem with a small fee, but just going in and saying, Hey, yeah, I'll go fill the paperwork out. I do it right. I, I'd rather do that. I'd rather my customer call and say, is this a registered uh, contractor? And they just say, yeah, he is. And that's good. It's not a recommendation. We're not putting a, a list together. It'll be free. So if you want to have whoever do it. And again, it's not about your neighbor is going to come over and, you know, fix your shutters or, you know, do some, a little bit of electrical work, you know, change some outlets in your house. 
I know that's probably, I shouldn't have probably said that, but because of the license for electrician, but it's never been about money. It's just been about who's working here. Just like the, the vendor's permit. I mean, nobody has, nobody said nothing about the vendor's permit. You know, but now we got people that we got people spending tens of thousands of dollars and we're not worried about who them people are. So I hope I uh, overdone myself. Is there any questions? Nope. No questions after all of that. Any comments? Good job. Is anybody with me on it or should I just throw this stuff all away? No. David, let us think about it because you answered a lot of questions tonight and I think the public will see this differently too after you've answered those questions. Yeah. Well, so you know you how think, it is. Honey, that you have good intentions on this. Yeah, and I'm I not, see, I not, see what you're trying to do. It's not a money thing. It's just, and the thing is, you know, you get, and everybody, we've all been here a long time. Some of us longer than others, right, Judy and Paul? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, the yeah. thing is, you know, you can have something and there, a lot of people like it, but you never get an email about it. But if there's a few people that don't like something, you're going to hear all about it. So, so far I've had three people that think it's a terrible idea and nobody else. So we'll see. I'm just, I never wanted to push this through. I actually did want to wait till we could just all get together because there was some tension, but they wanted to address it tonight. So I addressed it. So I hope I gave some decent answers to it. You know, I think I answered everybody's questions, but I'm sure I didn't and I'll get some more emails, but. Well, and by the time you get more emails, you'll answer everything. Yep. And I'll keep on doing it. So, oh, we got one. Does zoning hold the credentials to uphold a complaint? It's, it's basically, I would, you know, we've got to get into it more, but it's just that they showed that they have a license, not a license, they keep on saying license, that they're insured and bonded. It's, they're going to show us the same thing they show Summit County. It's not going to be extra. It's just going to be the same thing. And like I said, Chris at the building department said he has no problem with it. As long as we're not trying to, you know, make the standards. And again, like I said, it's not about workmanship. I mean, there's, there's licensed contractors that are bonded and licensed and uh, insured contractors that they're not the, you know, they're not the best just because they have that don't mean they, their work is, is high quality, you know, so it has nothing to do with the quality. It's just about who's here. Like I said, you can have windows put in, the county knows nothing about it. So we got a contractor in here and people are paying 10, 15,000 for new windows throughout their house. But they're, you know, you don't know who they are. Are they registered? You know, if they register with us for nothing, at least we got an idea who's here. So, all right, I'm done. <laughs> Get back to the, any other, uh, oh, we got any question? I got that. Whew, that was a mouthful. All right. Paul, <laughs> executive session, please say no. <laughs> no? Okay. All right. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. 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 All in favor. Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Next council meeting, March 17th. We'll start the committees at six. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.